Chris Koala. Um, we are, well, I'm literally live in the Castro. Um, <laughs> we're in other places. <laughs> we're nearby. Um, on this episode, we're interviewing Leslie Ma to get some of her stories on growing up, playing in Tribe 8, and battling cancer as a tattooer. Leslie has been tattooing since 1996 in the Bay Area. She was a part of the queer core music scene in the 90s with her band Tribe 8. Tribe 8 played with bands like Bikini Kill and Susie and the Banshees. And every time I see Leslie out in public, I want to swarm her with like 800 questions, but I like pick like (laughs) two questions for myself. And I'm like, okay, it won't be rude if I just ask two. And then I want to like keep going, but I stop myself because I'm like, oh, it's going to be rude. And I'm just taking up her time. So now I've got Leslie trapped and I can ask (laughs) all the questions that I want. (laughs) How are you guys doing tonight? Tonight, today. I'm doing well. Could you hear my dog barking? I feel like as soon as it started, someone started a leaf blower near my building and my dog just started barking. So hopefully <laughs> I don't it's hear calm it. from here on out. <laughs> no. I I can hear <laughs> um, I'm good. And hopefully people will be kind to us since this is your first uh, podcast that you're hosting. So congratulations. And this is my first time doing any kind of video interview like this live. Um, I was just saying that I'm an analog person. And, you know, I'm really grateful. Um, All the things that Gabe were saying that's happening on this channel just sound amazing. And like they're they're really building... um, uh, a really great thing, or I mean, they've been doing it for years, so I guess it's here. <laughs> and um, it's great that they're um, expanding to be more and more inclusive. So, yeah, awesome. thanks, thanks for them. And yeah. I think it's hilarious that you have so many questions for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, so basically, I want your entire life story, but. We only have an hour, (laughs) so I'll try to like steer it as much as I can um, with that stuff. Um, Would you start off by telling us some of your family history and maybe Gabe can pull up some photos um, that you sent? Um, I mean, my my family history is so uh, mythical. You know, I've got all these cousins and my dad has, um, he's from a family with, I don't know, seven kids. Um, And, um, you know, everybody has sort of a different version. Um, The eldest was 20, almost 20 when when they immigrated. And the, you know, the youngest was, you know, a baby. And then the the very youngest uh, sibling was born here. So, but they came over. um, From where? They, you know, just in my dad's short life there, they, he experienced like the Japanese insurrection and World War II. And then, you know, then the, you know, they, now it's called the communist revolution, but, you know, they refer to it as like the civil war and and it was it was pretty horrible i mean the the situation there was horrible you know of course before the civil wars even started happening but um it was uh 1947 and they had just lifted the chinese exclusion act um oops <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> but um which was you know it was it was a ban you know it was a racist ban on anybody of chinese heritage mm-hmm. um and you know we've we've been seeing that more recently where they're just there's the muslim ban and there's just like bans and all these you know basically people of color you know people from um places that aren't Europe. (laughs) And um, so, you know, this, 
the Chinese Exclusion Act lasted for 70 years. And mm -hmm. after World War II, you know, part of like working with China during World War II was like, okay, we'll start to ease the band. So in 1947, they gave visas to like 105 Chinese um, people. And the, this isn't citizenship, this is just visas. And my family got seven of them. Dang. Whoa. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> so it was a little bit nefarious, you know, how all of that happened. I'm not really sure. You know, there's just, there's some really sad stories about my grandfather losing his first wife and his first two children and, you know, being born very poor and not getting any education. But, you know, he ended up like having some pretty um, uh, interesting connections and it's sort of yet to be verified and it's also ver un unverified of like our ancestry um, my father's family is Muslim and um, we're not sure if we're way or if we're Uyghur um, so anyway there's a lot there and but when they came here um, my grandfather couldn't speak English and so he couldn't really work but he opened a tiny shop in um, Manhattan and um, called Mainz. I think you just saw a, a slide for that. And, you know, the, the girls, the sisters all worked in the shop for no pay, as my Aunt Ming Ching likes to always remind everybody, for, for years, you know, so the boys could get an education. And um, so on the left, there's uh, Ming Shu, and on the far right is Ming Ching and then the, the man is my grandfather and Ming Shu um, passed away early in her 20s from gynecological cancer and it's it's always been just sort of like well what exactly you know happened but she passed away and then both of her sisters um, all my father's sisters um, you know had tumors and so they were unable to have uh, children, they all had hysterectomies. And um, on my mother's side, my mother passed away in, um, about 25 years ago, younger than I am now, um, from gynecological cancer. And one of her sisters has had the same cervical cancer that I did. And the other sister also had survived uh, gynecological cancer. So it's like, all the women one generation older than me all had um, um, gynecological cancer. And, you know, they say it's not um, hereditary or, or genetic and that like cervical cancer is always caused by HPV, but I tested negative for HPV. Um, when I got my diagnosis, I, I called my dad and I called my sister. My sister was very distraught because, you know, our, our mother had passed from um, her cancer and um, she uh, when she got her uh, she went and got a pap pap and it came back positive so but she caught it early enough that she just had an outpatient procedure so you know so you guys I both always, had it at the same time yeah she had a, yeah. A, something different she had mm -hmm. squamous cell um, yeah um, so I, I feel like it's really important for people to, to continue to get their PAPs and, you know, I can sit here and tell people over and over to, to get tested and get your screenings, but if people don't have access to healthcare, that's, uh, you know, also a problem. Um, so, uh, that's anyway, I guess, I guess I just jumped forward to hereditary. Like they say, that's not hereditary, but then it's like Correct. most of the women in the family. That's pretty wild. All the women, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, sorry, could I just interject real quick? Leslie, could, sure. your microphone, sometimes when you're, you could touch it sometimes and it'll go crackle, but it's rubbing against your shirt. Oh. If you could just be a little bit aware of it. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Cool. All right. Thanks. Um, you were going to say that we jumped ahead a little to, mm -hmm. yeah, to that part, but it's great <laughs> introduction. Um, but so, okay, they opened that store in Brooklyn. Is that what you said? In Manhattan. Manhattan. But they lived in Queens. 
did you were you born in Queens and Manhattan or no you here? um I was uh, I was actually born in um Illinois where both of my parents had gotten well my father they both got scholarships to go to the University of Illinois and that's where they met my father was actually the first Asian person in the engineering department at the University of Illinois, the very wow. first. And now, um, and his younger brother also went to the same school and they recently went back and they were like, yeah, it's all, <laughs> it's all Asian people there now. Like, but yeah, That's my, awesome. um, yeah, my dad was uh, the first and his roommate was the second um, African-American to attend. So they, um, I don't know. There's, there, you know, there's the, the first out there, and their roommates. Um, his roommate was the second African American, but um, you know, they don't like a lot of people of that generation. They don't really tell the stories. They don't talk about how hard it was, you know. And and I know it was it was hard, like. Um, you know, when my aunt Ming Shu passed away really young, it was, it was very hard on the family. And um, I'm actually the, the first person, the first cousin of my generation. And I was named after her, my middle name, my, or my Chinese name. Um, so um, it, it, it feels sort of like this, you know, a legacy that, um, that we're stopping now <laughs> because, um, my niece and nephew, um, the children of my sister who, um, tested positive have both been vaccinated against HPV. And, um, and it just feels like, yeah, you know, we, we don't have to suffer <laughs> unnecessarily, you know? I mean, there's already so much suffering built into life, but. Oh, the um, beauty of vaccines there, right? Yeah, the, yeah. So actually this, this painting right here, <laughs> you can't see it. Um, it's called um, Demon Slayer. It's my niece when she was a teenager and she had just moved out. And um, she had just come back from Europe and she stayed with me for like 10 days. And I made her sit and <laughs> um, pose for me. And um, you can't really see it, but you can go to my Instagram and, and look at the whole process. I posted the, the process of, of painting this. And um, we actually went and bought a, a heart for her to hold and um, it was a little bit too mushy. So I ended up just using like a potato <laughs> carved into the shape. Um, so, um, yeah, the heart, she, she was such a good sport, right? I actually gave her the um, option of posing with an octopus or a heart and she chose the heart. So um, anyway, she... Um, octopus. Octopus would be... Pretty oh, you're going to go out <laughs> the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now I, now that I know more about octopuses, I, I would, I would, I wouldn't even, I don't eat them anymore or anything. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, there's a. Will you? Um, um, will you tell us how old you were whenever you started playing for Tribe Eight or started like playing music? Um, I was a little bit of a late bloomer. You know, I was one of those kids who, like, I, I slept with the radio on, and I listened to all kinds of music, and um, I, when I was really young, I used to think that if I fell asleep listening to classical music, I would just learn how to play it. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's a nice thought. <laughs> right? I mean, when you're a kid, like, you, you believe you have magical thinking, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. But um, so I was, I think I was like 19 when I first bought actually a bass guitar 
and um, I took lessons. And the, the person who actually really inspired me to play bass was Tina Weymouth of the Talking Heads. And the first song that I learned how to play was Psycho Killer on the bass. And um, it wasn't until um, I, I moved to San Francisco in 1988. Um, but I had a band, ASF, and actually I'm playing bass there, right? This is my, I think I'm maybe, I don't know, 20 or 21. And that's my girlfriend in the background who wanted to remain um, closeted. Um, but yeah, anti scrunchy faction. Wow. Now. With the twin mohawks, how are you? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Well, it's just, just really so good funny. friends. Yeah. <laughs> As the <laughs> <history> <laughs> says, really close. Yes. <laughs> Sisters. <laughs> we look nothing alike, but uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> we're actually playing at Clubfoot, which was um, a punk um, a punk venue in God, I think it was, I think it was in San Francisco. Um, and this is before I moved here. And uh, this is the first band that I toured with. We also played in um, Canada. We toured a little bit there. And um, the people who did uh, Homocore, the zine, um, oh, not Homocore, but JD's, which was one of the first queer zines, um, set up those shows. Uh, G.B. Jones and Bruce LaBruce, who's a filmmaker. They're both filmmakers. And um, they set up our shows in um, Toronto. So um, oh, I think your mic is hitting your shirt again. Uh, sorry. So annoying. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Here. Um, but once, you know, I mean, once we broke up, um, I moved to San Francisco in 88. And where were and you? Then- you were in Illinois? No, in Colorado. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I grew up in Colorado. Cool. And um, it was it, it was a definitely a, a different time and place than it is now. Um, Were you in Asia? Denver, big no. city or? Mm-mm. I was in Boulder, <laughs> which was a very okay. small hippie town, like a, mm-hmm. a well, CU was there. And mm-hmm. it was a much, a much smaller town. And, um, you know, it was, it was very different. It was, I think part of like, you know, getting a Mohawk was sort of just distract from being visibly uh, queer and kind of visibly also racialized. Um, There, there were so few, um, like the, the Asian population, it, like we were less than 1%. And I was such uh, people, you know, uh, to compliment me would, you know, refer to me as exotic, but you know, it was, it was pretty intense um, to be like very racialized there. And then to move to San Francisco where I suddenly felt very light skinned and also there's a lot less sunshine here so (laughs) all of a sudden I was like oh my god I really am Irish you know um (laughs) so I feel like I've had you know sort of a a unique um uh childhood and uh young adulthood because you know here in, in California it's it's there's you know there's really nothing unique so much or as much about like being mixed or definitely about being asian at all so um a lot of the um the things that happen to me in colorado just they just do not happen in in california at all it was a very different way of um being in the world and i actually stopped dyeing my hair (laughs) <laughs> it was like um, you know it doesn't matter anymore yeah. um how did you choose to move to san francisco um when i was like 18 me and my girlfriend to be um hitchhiked out here 
because we wanted to see punk bands that never came to Denver or Boulder. Yeah. And we did go see bands like all the time. Because, you know, I mean, if you're going to be on tour and actually he, you kind of have to drive through I-70. And so we, I actually did see a lot of bands, but um, we were kind of, you know, what they call a secondary market. <laughs> um, but there was like, like in San Francisco, I was so interested in the, the punk scene here. And we literally just went out on the street and stuck our thumbs out and ended up um in San Francisco and he stayed out there for about a week and then hitchhiked home and I wanted to move I wanted a different life I wanted to be somewhere you know there was a Chinatown and where there was like um a lot more going on Uh, you know definitely in in Colorado the punk scene became extremely gentrified in the like mid eighties and then um, white supremacists like just came in and really started to um, recruit um, everybody. And there were a lot of shows where my girlfriend and I were the only women at the shows. And it was crazy, you know, to, I heard they were recruiting in like punk shows and stuff. Oh, That's totally. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I've watched a, um, a documentary on the KKK and they're like in the junior grand wizard, you know, Sean Slater. I'm like, that guy used to be at all the punk shows <laughs> Whoa. You know? and he used to be beating people up, just whoever, you know, mm-hmm. um, is that when like the, like that punk backlash of like, like where you get like Nazi punks, punks fuck off and, um, mm, yeah I mean no 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 but then like right. it's also like a whole genre in it too like of like the skinhead punks and they're like oh. so yeah you know the the laces and your Doc Martens and mm-hmm. it, yeah it was it was people had this yeah it was very um fascination with Nazis and um just the aesthetic you know whereas like you know skinhead didn't start off that way it was Mm -hmm. something that happened in in England but um that was more of a a working class um uh culture so but yeah this this started happening it it was pretty it it got really bad you know people got beat up all the time it shows by the neo-nazis and you know when Columbine happened which is a really long time ago now. And people were just shocked because it was, you know, in um, Golden, Colorado, you know, mm-hmm. this little I town think it was where the they made cores. Yeah. Right. But it was, it was, you know, the, like the, the first big school shooting. And, yeah. you know, and it kind of came out that like these, these boys had a fascination with uh, Hitler and white supremacy and Nazis and people were just whatever shocked and they blamed mm-hmm. Marilyn Manson or whatever. And it's like, yeah. I wasn't shocked at all, you know, mm-hmm. at all because you're like seeing it firsthand, <laughs> like every day right. every time you try to go to these shows and stuff, you're like, Oh yeah, yeah they exist. Like yeah. when in a big city, you're like, you definitely get like all the aspects of society, like good and bad, but like all closer together. So you can like see it. Right. And then they're out in the, country and they're like oh I don't know I don't know huh (laughs) when you see that anger directed at you you're not as shocked when something like this happens maybe right I mean I was kind of I mean I'm like five two but um those boys were scared of me (laughs) you know (laughs) and um they should be I mean, there was, there was sort of this feeling that, you know, I don't know, I had, I didn't have fear in the pit, you know, and I actually got hurt a lot, but um, a lot, you know, I had, I'd been around for a few years, so I had some seniority, you know, Um, and I was in a band, so, but it, it definitely was, was tense, you know, and, and there were definitely a lot of those folks who, you know, they would get drunk and they would start admitting that like, well, I, you know, I don't want to be gay, but you know, (laughs) 
<laughs> but what? Yeah. <laughs> but, but they, you know, would have like, they would talk about, you know, sleeping with or having sex with or even having like a, a boyfriend or girlfriend. And um, so, it was, yeah, it was bullshit. But I definitely wanted, I wanted to leave because it just felt like I couldn't hold my own and, you know, and, and my girlfriend that I had been with for years didn't want to be out. So what about in the queer core scene? Like, do you think those shows like felt like a safer place? Oh yeah. Well, that was totally different. Right. Yeah. So that was, you know, that didn't happen until like the early nineties. So I'm, talking about like the mid 80s in Colorado and then you know I mean it took like seven or seven eight years for us to you know DIY our own scene so you know when that happened it was a very different thing and it's also like when when you're on stage you have a certain amount of power like you have the microphone the lights are on you you know, and you can call people out. I mean, that was something that we did and a lot of other bands started doing of like, hey, you know, you stop this shit, you know, you'd stop playing and say, you know, get kick this person out, you know, and I would always be like, hey, short, short people in front, you know, we want the women in front, like we want the queers mm-hmm. in front. And, and that was like, amazing to be able to request that you know it felt really really good of just like you know and if anyone gave me any slack it'd be like look you can go on any other show and you can be in front you know and you're welcome to be here but it, you're not in the middle like you, you you just it's not about you tonight and you you're okay <laughs> yeah and then if they keep giving you shit then like you have the power to stop the whole show. <laughs> your, your head is at my boot. So <laughs> like it's a stamp. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think your favorite show or one of your favorite shows was that you played with Tribe Eight? Ooh, it's really a blur. We played a lot of shows. Okay, you're most memorable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, with a lot of hindsight, it, I mean, the most horrible ones, like everybody was sick. Um, I um, injured myself. Like I ran into a rusty nail coming out of a sound booth in the Midwest somewhere and punctured my calf. <laughs> and that really sucks. <laughs> um, oh, wait. He's oh, do you want to hear clip. a clip? I want to, uh, yeah, I want to see it. Let's do it, Gabe. I was going to play it uh, silently, but I'll, I got the tunes on here. Hold on. Let's yeah, I want to hear some. What's going on? Flipper. Oh, I might need to share it with this is being wonky, huh? Sorry about this. Uh, let me. Uh... All right. Well, we'll continue. <laughs> let us know when you when you got a <laughs> clip. <laughs> um, this is um, a, a rockumentary by Tracy Flanagan, and mm-hmm. she um, she came to a few of our shows and decided that she wanted to make a documentary and. That was oh, kind of a weird thing, but I'm, I'm so glad I should have watched she it did it. What's that? I said, I should have watched it before. That's so exciting. I want to watch it. Oh, it's not taking the... Uh, oh, what about one of those uh, music videos, if it has one of those? It seems like a... Or you could roll it. We could just talk. Yeah. The thing is, as soon as I start, it stops. Hmm. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. It's probably not like in the YouTube for uh, okay, sorry about that. Oh, good. Um, okay, so the one where you had a nail punctured, puncture your calf. <laughs> was that? I mean, that, that was pretty horrible. 
<laughs> it, it did end up getting infected. It was pretty gnarly. <laughs> um, I mean, it was, it was so different touring back then. Cause like you would just, you would leave and you wouldn't know that you would, didn't, we didn't have cell phones, right? We didn't have computers. <laughs> it was really different. Um, and we had this thing called ocean in a bottle. And it was basically a, um, you would just get a tape recording of the sound of quarters falling into a payphone. And then you would pick up the phone and <laughs> you would play it, right? Like on your Walkman. Hackers in- style, the movie Hackers, they do that. Oh, and it was okay. an old well, trick so- that I've heard, yeah, it really worked. All right. <laughs> you guys yeah. invented it. Right? You did yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> We did it. And then, Wait, so what know, would happen? Would... So you, that's how you would record the sound? Or... Well, yeah. And, but then you would just, you would just have this tape, right? And you would play it into the phone uh-huh. and then you would call people. But, you know, it was, it was kind of hard. You couldn't, you couldn't make a phone date. You would just randomly call people and um, you would try and make it a time that you would call again. But it was kind of un- like, would you be able to find a um, a phone booth in Ypsilanti that was available at that time? Would you even like get there to the show um, or, you know, like how long would sound check take or whatever? So mm-hmm. it, it was, you know, it was a lot harder, I think, um, in some ways, but then in other ways, like you were so present in the van, like you were so stuck in this like (laughs) container with like five other people that um you're just passing well yeah and you're just passing germs back and forth (laughs) (laughs) one person gets sick a couple two shows later everyone's sick and you never have a tour where people aren't sick so do you feel like you have any moment that you're like, oh, that was the best day on stage? Or like, oh, that was like so awesome. Whenever. I don't know. I've heard um, some. I don't want to bring them up. I want to. I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it was always really fun to play Madison, Wisconsin. Um, but I can't remember if this particular event happened in Madison. But there was a particular person who was harassing us a lot. He was super drunk and um, he kept trying to get on stage and I kept like, no, (laughs) trying to hold the line. And when he did, you know, I was like, dude, you got to get off, off, off. And he wouldn't. And I picked him up and I tossed him and he actually really caught a lot of air. <laughs> but, like you're you know, he was just, I mean, he was drunk and hopefully, you know, I mean, I'm pretty sure he survived. <laughs> but, so, I don't know. That's... I don't know if I should have mentioned that because people might <laughs> judge my yes. character based on that. <laughs> and yeah, I'm not I, really, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not in that kind of situation anymore. I don't know if I would do that again, but. Um, sure. I, you would. Come on. Um, right. So Crowd I, surfing I, is always fun. I'm fascinated by these photos of your shows. You've, you, you've even showed like me and Jess some, um, when we're out and stuff but um where it's like that one that was um posted recently we probably you know won't show it on here um but uh where there's like a chick with her shirt off holding the mic and she's wearing like baggy pants and then it looks like a fucking punk show around it and I'm like that is like the queerest most punk rock thing I have ever seen you know um so like this is what I imagine your shows like just like wild and like also like these like safe split places and you get to play with like Bikini Kill and L7 and stuff like that and it's like wow if I could have been there actually you know who was there at one of your shows Jess 
Jess has photos. I, yeah, I saw you. I, so I couldn't find any uh, for today because they're all at my parents' house in Southern California. But uh, I tried to dig up, see if my mom could dig up some photos. But um, yeah, I saw you guys when I was 17. You were playing with La Tigra. And it was incredible. And I'm positive that I have pictures of you on stage because it was like a life-changing thing for me. You know, I was this 17-year-old young queer kid and it was a completely different experience. It was, you know, it, it was absolutely incredible. And I remember you on stage, you know, you guys were amazing. And um, I, uh, when I met you, I didn't realize that it was you from Tribe 8. I knew you, Leslie Ma, as a tattooer. And uh, so it was pretty crazy when, you know, I figured out that it was you, we were out for drinks and uh, you had mentioned, you know, my band Tribe 8. And I was like, oh my gosh, the worlds came together, you know, and I realized that you were also in this band that I had seen and pretty incredible. Like your band was incredible live and... I I remember it more like you talking about mm -hmm. that La Tigre show and I said, mm -hmm. oh, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you were like, oh, you were? And yeah. I said yeah. something like, yeah, I was, I was playing guitar and uh -huh. you said, you know Lynn Breedlove? <laughs> <laughs> And you're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, I know Lenny <laughs> pretty well. Yeah, that and Lenny's doing so very good. well right now, despite good. all the fucking shit that he's been going through. But yeah, he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that you got him to read at the, read at the Queer Tattoo Alliance event. I was like so excited. Yeah. Um, so how old were you when you got into tattooing? Was this in the band stuff? Yeah, well, I, um, I was a fabric cutter mm -hmm. and I couldn't. Um, and I also, I went to San Francisco City College and um, taking a lot of like different art classes, but I would also take like astronomy and um, just, it was just something that, I don't know, I, I was so, and I also had like side projects and stuff. And, you know, we were all trying to be non-monogamous. It was really quite, it was very <laughs> messy. <laughs> he couldn't really like, uh, you know, there was just, there was so much like uh, multitasking chaos, but um, uh, tattooing, I didn't get into it until 96. So how old was I? I was already in my 30s and um you know it's something that I loved and I was I was something of you know I, I I got my first tattoo you know my first tattoos in Colorado and um it was not a popular thing to do um I got one on the side of my head and um I so I mean I I think I also did it to scare the skinheads to shave the sides of my head and have tattoos, you know, <laughs> but um, there was also always like, you know, are you a real punk? Are you truly hardcore? And, you know, proving your authenticity. Um, and I remember I got, I was getting tattooed by Freddie Corbin who hadn't been tattooing very long. And I was you know, talking about like, it, it, there was such a huge, I mean, uh, movement in the early 90s in San Francisco. And they, you know, there's like all those uh, books like Modern Primitives and everything that came out um, about, you know, tattooing, but it was kind of like all white guys and they were doing kind of tribal work and stuff, you know, and it, you know, and I, I kind of, was having this conversation with Freddie Corbin about it and he was like well stop looking for the kick-ass you know badass lady you know tattoo artist and just become one and I was like oh. yeah and and it was so out of character from you know the attitude I think at the time that I remember it really clearly and um you know, but it took a long time for that to happen, you know. Um, 
so yeah, 96, it was right when, um, I, I definitely wanted a, I, I wanted a, a, you know, a chance to, to do this thing that I really wanted to do. And it, you know, as we, you know, all know, like the, the gatekeeping is, uh, ha- or has been historically, um, you know, like bikers and, you know, very yeah, I mean, white guys. There, the first time I ever worked with a woman tattoo artist was in San Francisco. And that's like a good, like, um, like eight years into my career. And I was like, oh, they're going to be so mean and like hard because they've been through so much shit. Cause like, I was used to the, the bikers and stuff that I used to work with and uh like oh always like sad face you know Mm -hmm. um and then i was like oh man the girls are gonna be so salty i'm about to work at this shop with like four women and i go in there and they're all like happy and like giggling (laughs) they've been doing this for years i'm like oh my god everything's fine like why are they so happy this is great this is great and i just (laughs) i was just amazed i was like oh my god lady tattoos this is the coolest thing and queers you know like jeez yeah i feel that though like just not that many right no. right so, but in the bay area yeah that, that wow. has been so you know and i i'm hoping that it's it's different you know I, um right we, there's a lot of things going on like on instagram uh, during the pandemic because we kind of are a little bit um overwhelmed and <laughs> trying to figure out what to do with ourselves and I think that, you know, a lot of these issues about, um, you know, tat- tattooing on dark skin and the, the gatekeeping of, you know, the white guys and Oh my God, do you want to us- talk about that picture? You want to talk about sure. that? Hey, yeah, that. well, this, this photo, um, well, this article I saw from just a couple days ago and the, the Proud Boys had a big, you know, rally in DC. Um, you know, I seem to think that um, whatever they think, but they 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 take some sort of um, commitment to what they call Western chauvinism. Is yeah. their <laughs> is their theme of white supremacy? I mean, it's just basically white supremacy, right? White yeah. chauvinism. Uh, or Western chauvinism, same thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I'm just like, <laughs> I immediately look at this photo. I always look at people's tattoos because, you know, that's, that's what we, we do. We describe the, the image for uh, when this is just a podcast. It's like, so it's the, the headline, it's from Slate. And the headline says, uh, the church pastor Um, on Trump supporters burning their Black Lives Matter sign. It was reminiscent of cross burnings. And I actually saw the clip of this and it was viscerally just offensive and sickening. Um, And then, you know, yeah. Right. And so it's, it's sort of this, right, this crowd of like guys with beards and, you know, mirrored sunglasses, you know, they're just so angry. <laughs> and they're, they're so mad, they won't wear masks. And, you know, they're whatever, they're rebels. And this, the, the man who's front and center has these tattoos. And on his left arm, it looks like, you know, it's an East Asian dragon. And it's very poorly executed, right? And then on his right arm is this really terrible ripoff of like a Borneo, you know, Pacific Islander um, tribal. Yeah. (laughs) Which which maybe, you know, he didn't actually get in 1990. He he got in 2006. (laughs) And then... um, the other one, I couldn't quite tell what it was. I'm like, just, if he has a Black Panther, like, <laughs> like they're just hilarious, <laughs> right? man. He's right. like, well, he's got it somewhere. I know it. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. But he has Antifa <laughs> tattooed on his butt. But he, um, 
uh, actually Karen Rose, the owner of Sacred Rose, who's been tattooing a very long time, um, identified it as a very poorly renditioned um, Sailor Jerry flash mm -hmm. of a wolf. And this particular image was used in uh, posters in England. And it was all like, you know, be, be quiet, you know, don't, don't share state secrets with the Germans, you know, the Nazis, right? It was the anti-Nazi propaganda. And I was like, no shit, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <That's amazing>. so, <laughs> like, man, do you know like, what your tattoos has mean? No yeah. idea, like what he's wearing as he's right. burning right. this and, Black Lives Matter thing. And, and uh, you know, um, a friend of mine who's indigenous and, and black and European mixed was just like, I, these, <laughs> you know, they just want to cherry pick like these symbols of masculinity and power and, and they don't care. And it's like clearly the tattoo artist who, or whoever, you know, did these tattoos, like they, they have no respect for these cultures or, you know, they don't know what they're doing. And, you know, it's just this, it's so, it's also symbolic of like, Western chauvinism, what are you even talking about? You know, you're gonna. <laughs> um, yeah, you're like gonna like represent all these cultures on your body, but then like definitely like is the one making fun of like or like saying racist shit basically about like the virus and like burning down Black Lives Matter and stuff like, but you're gonna put it all over you, all these other yeah. cultures. What is happening? Like, but it's, it's well, like the tattoo artist's responsibility and his responsibility, right? And like, mm. we should be able to like, obviously not put culturally inappropriate things on angry white men or like white men in general, right? But I mean, I it's right. It's so, I, I don't know. I can't, like, it's just ridiculous. I, I'm not even, I personally am just like, oh my God. <laughs> I think it's hilarious or ridiculous yeah. but you know it's I like, mean what they're I doing is angle with no respect right like, yeah and can just just the absolute ignorance of it all I mean you know I mean if you if you have a kanji tattoo you don't get to talk about how Chinese people eat bats and shit like that you know right? I mean I've had to unfollow people who were talking like that where it's just like, no, it's not the Wuhan flu. It's not, you know, like, stop it with that. And like at least have some respect for your own tattoos. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> like the ones that are like on your body, like the person with the kanji, like might want to like look at that and be like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I should probably. <laughs> well, I mean, for me also, it also speaks to, he doesn't really actually have self-love he doesn't you know like he's not making I don't know you're putting shit like on your body like you can do that once or twice but god all of, you know it's just like those are so bad your whole body <laughs> <laughs> brutal like it's just you know like, don't get the cheapest goddamn tattoo, you know? Just don't. Like, you're worth more than that or no, mm -hmm. you're not, okay? Mm -hmm. You know? Like, yeah. respect yourself, respect the art, and respect the culture that you, like, is inspiring you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Know about the tattoos that you're getting, not just pick something off of a wall. Like, you know, what does yeah. it mean? Yeah. This shit looks tough. Hell Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, I we have a little bit more time I do want to touch on um, like you battled a very deadly cancer as I'm learning like a lot of your um, a, a lot of the women in your family um, and you still deal with major repercussions of it today right of how it's hurt your body and stuff but what was that like as a tattoo artist, whenever we don't have like this health insurance system or like, you know, we're all like independent contractors and everything. What, what was that like for you? I don't know how to ask that question exactly, but. Well, um, 
I was very fortunate in that I was on my partner's insurance for less than a year before I got diagnosed. And um, it was a hard thing for me to ask her to do it. But after we'd been together for a couple years, I was like, hey, you know, would you, <laughs> we had to, I had to ask a few times, I had to bring it up, but um, so I was very fortunate. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, great. Right. Because um, so I, I, I spent decades without health insurance. And um, it was, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is a good shot. <laughs> it's actually of, of, beautiful, but then it's also, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Punk as fuck, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, like that nose bleeding one that you have? I was like, damn, you're so... That funny. was... Um, <laughs> that was my... After a year of, of chemo, and um, I, was, I was chemo sick, I had to reduce the amount of chemo that I was doing. But I, I got diagnosed, and I had a 70% chance of survival, and then it came back. And I had a 25% chance of survival, but I had to have a major surgery that removed a lot of vital organs. And, um, and then the final pathology of that surgery showed that um, the disease had metastasized to my lymphatic system. And my chances of survival were zero. And um, so I, I just had this major radical surgery that rearranged my, all my guts. And, um, and, you know, I got this news and I was like, okay, but you know, I'm not done. And my, um, my oncologist was like, well, there's a, there's a chemo um, clinical trial that's showing some promise and but he made it clear that it wasn't a curative thing. It was like, it'll give you more time. And I was like, well, how much time? And he's like, about three and a half months. So, you know, it was like, fuck, am I going to do this chemo to for have another three and a half months? And, you know, but I did end up doing the chemo and I did the chemo for a year and ended up chemo toxic and yeah. had to have... 12 units of, of blood in one shot, you know, and that, that was the, the nosebleed one. Cause I had no platelets. Like that was, <laughs> was pretty dramatic, but you know, I, I was just like, you know, once I, I got the news that, you know, I had a poor prognosis. I was just like, I, I'm, I actually went septic so I was in ICU for a while and it was such a horrible experience that I promised myself I wouldn't die in the hospital and that I wouldn't like get to a place where I was, you know, just like not even ambulatory anymore. And this is before the death with dignity law was passed in California. And I looked into my options and I found uh, a, um, a nonprofit like activist group who, who help people have, choose their, their own peaceful deaths. And I made a plan. And once I made that plan, I was like, I, I have this great plan for a worst case scenario and now I'm just gonna live and I'm gonna tick everything off my bucket list and I'm gonna go in for chemo. And you know, that experimental treatment thing that mm -hmm. was like not supposed to cure, but prolong. Yeah. Uh, so it was giving people like, uh, meet the median was three and a half more months of life. People were mm -hmm. living a little, a few months longer. Um, otherwise like my, I had maybe a year to live and with this chemo, I had maybe 16 months. So my, um, life expectancy was, February of 2016 and but my scan started coming back clean and oh my god 
everyone was just like, okay, but still like, okay, any minute, like the cancer will come back. And so I had to go get these PET scans every three months. And um, it was just from the weird experimental thing or not, not the weird experimental thing, but the, the, yeah, the, the clinical trial chemo. And um, it, and I, I really went for it, you know, I mean, I went to my, to my like whole like body collapsed and then, and then I only did the experimental drug. It's called bevacizumab. And um, so I did that for another year, <laughs> um, you know, and I, I did a lot of, I did a lot of chemo and I wouldn't, you know, it's not the kind of treatment that you would do if you were to think that you were going to live right or survive it so um so what was the explanation for um this thing putting you it put you into remission right the experimental trial Mm -hmm. what it did like it was only supposed to prolong right it wasn't supposed to be a cure right but it ended up um at about three years when it didn't come back, like I was, you know, always Googling and doing research and like mm-hmm. kind of stalking the, the, you know, oncologists who um, were had done the clinical trial and like, and they posted, um, you know, the, the long-term results. And um, I mean, the FDA ended up approving these drugs yeah. Um, and, uh, pretty, pretty soon after, you know, my, my doctor was like, you should do this. And, um, the, I, I found, you know, their, the most recent, um, information and 7% of people who were in the clinical trial were in remission. That's and it's so right. Great. It's the, the odds That's, are terrible. I know right? the odds are just terrible and I'm fucking lucky. It's insane. I, I did a lot of other things. And just thinking that you were like, Oh, well, all right. Well, I guess I'm like going to mm-hmm. die next year. And then it was, it was very just, surreal. And you're just supposed to get a couple more months mm-hmm. for that to be, I don't know. It's yeah. amazing. I mean, it's very the surreal odds. to get, a cancer diagnosis and then for it to come back and for it to come back and then to be told that you have a year or maybe more, maybe less, but a year statistically. And, and then it's surreal to sort of be like, okay, (laughs) you know I mean? You just, and so it's been, it's actually been a hard adjustment to like, Oh shit, I got to worry about the future again. You know, when I realized I was really worried about the future again, it was like, whoa. I mean, it's so different to be like, yeah, I can make a plan next month. You know, yeah. when, when I first, when it was first like, yeah, I can, I can like, you know, I, yes, I am going to see the end of Game of Thrones. <laughs> you know, just like little <laughs> things like that. <laughs> like I was, yeah. you know, I, I have a cousin who actually knows George R. R. Martin and I was going to like start begging her. You're like, I really t- just need to know need what to happens. Know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was just, yeah, I was very like, but I, I did a lot of things that um, I wanted to do. And even um, I started oil painting, something that I wanted to do oh, you're before I died. You're so, yeah, you're great. Ah. You're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very, Love very him. good instructor. <laughs> and I've been working with him for a few years now. And uh, so the more I the more I paint, the more I'm like, holy shit, like this is really fucking intense, right? This is so, <laughs> I will never <laughs> understand like how, how this is done. Um, but, you know, there's a very, very thin <laughs> silver lining, right? That I got to do that. I got, I, I got to kick, uh, uh, tick a lot of things off of my bucket list. 
I went to Angkor Wat and I saw the Northern Lights. Oh, and amazing. I went scuba diving with sharks. Oh. So that's amazing. Um, we are out of time today, but I am so glad you are here. Oh, um, but and- uh, uh, what if, any, any chance we have a little bit of time for Q&A sure. from? Uh- yeah, I'd be happy to. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah, I'm, just, I'm like, oh, people, was anyone out there? <laughs> yeah, was anyone? I feel like we're just doing... Uh, I'm glad a, that we turned off the comments. <laughs> uh, there's uh, more, more people watching now than when we started. Cool. Um, let's see here. How about, uh, we'll start from the back forward. Uh, Kiera, uh, how did you keep pushing through knowing your family health history? You know, what, 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 what mentally kept you... Um. I think actually my mother's death really informed a lot of my decisions. Um, she didn't have any health insurance and she was, uh, you know, she was like, um, she cleaned houses. She was an artist too, but she, um, you know, she lived in a, in a house up in the mountains with like no running water or central heating or anything. And she, um, she didn't trust doctors. And she made a lot of decisions um, to, to, to not pursue Western medicine. Um, you know, she was a tarot reader and she had, I have her crystals now. And, um, and it's really important to have like a spiritual practice or some sort of connection. I, I really worked hard to come up with some something like that. I, I actually had I put together a spiritual team and I had some really good people um, supporting me. So but I, I yeah I I got all the chemo, I got all the radiation, I did them, you know, I <laughs> a cyber human, you know, because of, um, <laughs> uh, the surgery. And I, um, I wanted, I wanted to, I, I thought a lot about all of the people who had to survive in order for me to exist. And I, I thought about that, like they're literally my DNA, which was the thing that, you know, that cancer, you know, uh, or originates from the, and so thinking about, you know, my mom, you know, not going to the doctor when she knew something was wrong and then, you know, really not wanting to, to get any kind of help that was, uh, like Western medicine, you know, she would go to the acupuncturist, which is, you know, great. if like, I don't, it's not cancer, <laughs> but, um, so that, that informed a lot of my decisions to just be like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. And I'm fortunate. I live in the Bay area and I have health insurance right now. I mean, I'm on Medicare now, but, um, okay. um actually, uh, speaking of San Francisco, uh, and my pronunciation is always horrible. Uh, but uh, Kiara from the chat room says, uh, hello, a native here from San Francisco. How do you feel about SF with all of the changes? That might be a question for the San Francisco people. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the question was, um, what do we think about all the changes in San Francisco? Correct. What was it? Um, I'm not native from San Francisco. I think okay. Kiara should tell us about it. I know Kiara. <laughs> but right. um, <laughs> but uh, there's so many different levels, right? There's like the COVID level of change. There's the gentrification level of change. You know, it's uh, there's a lot. There's a lot to talk about there. I don't know. I feel like we could do an entire like I know. episode I'm just like, on that. So it's like, right, oh, where to start? Here, you need to call in. <laughs> yeah. You need to tell us about uh-huh. it. Yeah, yeah, because it's like there's so many businesses closing right now just because of COVID. And then it's like you think about, you know, the just the last. I've been in the Bay for almost 15 years. And so it's like you think about, you know, just the changes from the tech industry. And, you know, it's 
we could I feel like go on Leslie, for a while it's Leslie, you were probably here um whenever that first tech boom happened huh yeah you're well, in right now I am I had a owner move an eviction in uh 1999 or 2000 and then another one like just two years after that and um it ended up being illegal the the owner move in eviction because they never actually moved in to the building after they kicked us out. So we sued them and I got a chunk of change and I moved to Oakland and got a condo and then went through a, the housing bubble, which was also mm. a nightmare because <laughs> yeah. as a homeowner, that was, that was terrible. But that, yeah, th this is like a very important conversation. But mm -hmm. Well, the, her other question was about uh, how many instruments do you play? And are you going to be doing any, quote, live shows in the, in the near future? Yeah. Well, besides COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was doing some recordings, some music. Um, I was actually doing a, like a, I don't know, a, a swan song EP um, when I was really sick. And then I, um, yeah, I was going to have my ashes pressed into the vinyl. Yeah. <laughs> it was going to be spe That's special collector's edition for my family and friends. Um, and I actually was writing music for it. <laughs> But um, I don't know. And then I survived. And um, <laughs> so like it's on hold. All these plans, huh? <laughs> I know. It's on hold. Sorry. <laughs> Put out that record, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> but with less sad lyrics. Without, yeah, the ashes. Without the ashes. Yeah, let's put it out right. now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's going to have a great ending, you know? I mean, having a great ending is a great privilege. Mm -hmm. That's something that I really, really understood because when I was in the hospital, um, just it, and and seeing the news of like you know planes being shot down and like all these terrible like you know wars happening and bombings happening and you know people getting killed by police and it was like holy fuck I'm lucky. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I'm going to have a good death, but hopefully still years from now. Yeah. Okay, we've got a, we another one here. Uh, Nakobi, I resonate with that being a biracial queer uh, person of color in Portland. How did you navigate being a queer person of color in the punk scene with all of that Nazi presence? Um, I, I mean... I was a really angry um, punk rocker, you know, that's, you know, and, and I played music, I played bass very aggressively and um, yeah, and I got tattoos. <laughs> Some of them were by, you know, to myself. Just like getting that anger out and that, like all that build yeah. up, out, it's like just finding little releases. Oh. Right. And, you know, I mean, back then we were, it was about shock art too, as well. Now I, I feel like the right wing has taken over the, the shock art <laughs> and, and the punks were like, let's be nice to each other. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I feel, I don't know. I mean, it, I think it's maybe it's, a lot of things are the same, but I also feel like things, things are different, you know, I mean, racialized people are just still, um, I don't know, the, the difference, the different ones, the others. Time for uh, one or two more? Or, uh... Yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah, totally. Perfect. Let's, uh, we've got a, a, one more question and then a comment or a comment and then a question. Okay, so the, uh, this is such an incredible, intentional and necessary discussion. 
uh, with exclamation point. Sorry, this is such an incredible, intentional, and necessary discussion. Such power. Uh, thank you for this interview. Love it. <laughs> What's their uh, name? That's uh, also from Nakobi. And then uh, oh. the last question is, uh, do you feel that you have carried the women in your family with you through your life journey? I've had people who are healers who have said that I, I'm healing a, a family. Um, yeah, there's like a generational healing happening. But I'm also like, well, there's also that HPV vaccine. But yeah. Um, I, I think about, you know, a, a lot of people who, who don't have access to health care and, uh, and, and how much harder it was, you know, even just 20 years ago. I mean, things, it's, it's so important to, to fund, you know, uh, medicine research. I mean, that's why we got the COVID vaccine so quickly is because that research has been going on for decades. And, you know, if we could <laughs> put our resources there more than like, you know, defense. So many more people die of cancer than of terrorism. <laughs> yes absolutely and uh, uh my, my question is is uh is your camera uh, mobile could you like zoom in or, or check out some of your paintings before we go or cool uh, sure it's <laughs> very it's my phone so awesome yes um i don't know if you can see right, just go, if you go slowly then uh okay oh you gotta turn on some lights these are not finished. Okay, I, I put I put up the unfinished oh, ones. Yeah. This it's is a, a landscape painting from my most recent class um, from Joaquin Miller Park. And um, did you do it live? Like we're like hanging out there? Or oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, it was, it was very cold, and um, <laughs> I was on a hill and. It was very challenging. <laughs> um, this is actually uh, my Pilates teacher, Teresa. She has Pilates bar and jams, and uh, I'm still working with her now, but now online. Um, uh, it's That's probably awesome. too bright. This, this is also, I thought That's maybe so it was beautiful. finished. And my instructor said, fingers and toes. So, <laughs> like, just like oh it. my god! <laughs> uh, so I have to work on her a little more. She has all these hummingbirds that live outside oh, her house that she uh, puts feeders up for. So oh, I so included funny. that. And then I mean, there's just all this other, you know. Go slow, go anyway. slow. I want to see all the other. <laughs> slowly, <laughs> slowly, just. It's like big. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, but but like, those two, out. I'm I'm hoping to finish these two. So I, I actually just put them up. <laughs> beautiful. Like, I can't wait to see. Yeah. yeah, those are so beautiful. Thank you. Oh, um, is that all the questions? Uh, there, there might, there's a couple more people hopping on, but it feels like uh, you always want to leave them wanting a little bit more, right? So uh, maybe um, uh, I can yeah. close it out. Um, you can see these images we talked about today on my website. I'm gonna. It, it'll be under HaleyAdamsTattoos.com on that first page. I don't know if you guys post any anywhere, but Haley is H-A-L-E-Y AdamsTattoos.com. If you'd like to follow Leslie Ma on Instagram, her handle is. Leslie Ma, M A H tattoo, and for Jess, it's Jess downspace koala K O A L A downspace tattoo, and for me, it's Haley Adam at Haley Adams tattoo. If you like to follow the QTA, it is at Queer Tattoo Alliance on Instagram. Um, I'd like to thank Gabe, Gabe Ripley and Guy Aitchison for making this possible. Um, yeah, live in the Castro District of San Francisco. See everybody later. Thank you. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to click the button. Cheers. We'll talk again uh, next.